Hello, welcome to another edition of The Recap. I am Jermaine Hatton. Today is the 23rd day of May 2017. If you are joining me for the first time, The Recap is my take of an online podcast which seeks to explain for our English B students poems that appear on the English syllabus 2018 to 2023. Today, we are going to look at the exciting poem Dulce et Decor Mest by Wilfred Owen. It's a wonderful poem. If you're Latin and you are offended by my pronunciation, my humblest of apologies. I trust that you can hit me up and let's learn from each other. Let me know that real pronunciation, all right? We have looked at already. This is a Dark Time, My Love by Martin Carter. A link will be in the description there for you to check that out. If you haven't done so already, I suggest you do that though before we move to this one. For notes on these two poems, I suggest you hit my friend up, Antoinette Blair from Jamaica. She's doing an excellent job on her blog for all notes English A and English B. You go ahead and hit her up there and you will see all what you want to know for English A and English B preparations. All right. So Dolce at the Quorum S, for persons who do not already know, was written by Wilfred Owen, who happened to be a First World War uh, soldier it was a British soldier in the First World War, and in fact, he died at the age of 25. And this poem here, Dolce et Decorum Est, was in a letter that he sent to his mother one week before he died, and he died one week before the ending of the First World War. It's all up in the fields here, but trust me, it's a wonderful poem once you get to understand it, and I do hope you enjoy this reading here as well. So sit back and let me try to explain Dulce et Decorum Est for you. Dulce et Decorum Est, Wilfred Owen bent double like old beggars under sacks knock kneed coughing like hags we cursed through the sludge till the hunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rests began to trudge men marched asleep many had lost their boots but limped on bloodshod all went lame all blind Drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and flundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes, and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smuttering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the fraught, corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as a cut of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend. You would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro portrea mori. So Dulce et decorum est is uh, Latin to mean that it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. It's quite ironic because in the poem we do not see any sign of it being sweet or fitting to die for one's country. So Will Friend excellently, uh, ironically puts the title out there that dismisses all the, the, the lies of what young men are being told of this war being a good thing 
for their esteem and this war being a good thing to serve their country so he's putting right out there that ironic statement it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country so let's, let's look at our line by line review now hopefully you get a chance to appreciate the brilliance in this writing and hopefully you get a chance to understand what is going on in it as well so yeah I hope you do have a copy of the poem with you so you can go through it as we list or as we talk about the poem and as we list our devices so let's look at it together so the first line the first two lines more or less is describing what is going on describing how the soldiers are so on your right we see a layout of what or how the world war the first world war was fought uh, I'll talk about a bit about that just now but it's important for that to be there so don't pay attention to that we'll get to that just now so it says bent double like old beggars on the sacks who are they talking about they're saying that the soldiers appear to be bent their arched backs knock need and they were coughing coughing like hags so the first comparison is made between the soldiers and beggars so imagine that they're saying that these young men that were fighting to defend their country were like beggars can you imagine so Wilfred says they appear to be beggars on the sacks and he, he went on to say that they were coughing like hags and hags mean old ugly looking women so just imagine that one minute they're beggars and the other minute they're on attractive old women that is just awesome description right there and then he went on to say we cursed through sludge that tells me that what they were doing they were not doing it happily they were barely doing it and the sludge I'm thinking thick mud like pastures and they're, they're they're going at it and they appear to be as though they're very tired and they hate what they're doing but they're still going at it he says still our haunting flares we turned our backs and that's very important so this part brings me to that little sketch i have on the right there where it says german trenches at the top i'm looking at that as north and the bottom says British trenches and then at the middle no man's land now this is a little sketch of how the first world war was fought so at it at north we would have the British trenches so it was actually like ditches in the ground where the soldiers hid uh, to fire shots at the enemy so no man's land is the, the separation between the British soldiers and the German soldiers, right? So what happened in it, it's saying here till our haunting flares we turned our backs. So they were fa they were charging towards the enemy in the German trench or towards the German trenches and now they are about to go back to where their camp was around the British trenches there so they're moving back from north they're moving from north towards south and there they would have their rest so he says what towards our distant rest began to trudge all right and then it goes on to talk about how they were walking so after they they, they tired themselves out they're walking back to this relaxation there down south where the british trenches were where they can actually relax he says men march asleep they were so tired that it appeared as though they were asleep not literally it could mean literally but they were marching in such tiresome way that they appeared to be asleep, right? So many had lost their boots and limped on bloodshot. Now that's very important. It shows the extent to which they were tired. They might have lost their boot, but they were not so interested in the boot. All they wanted to do to, was to get to their resting place so they can just relax. The blood shot there is just blood oozing into the tissue of the foot. Uh, not escaping of course but in, in the tissue there before actually coming out of the skin. You know I'm typically sure everybody in the Caribbean knows what a blood shot looks like or we say a blood shot. Uh, so I'm quite sure you have an understanding of what that is and it says all went lame all blind and that is very interesting 
it says all went lame, all blind. Now, it's interesting to know that we are comparing these soldiers to lame and blind as though they were not clear exactly where they were heading. That's an interesting description there. Let's go back and look at that bloodshot. I want you to have a good picture of what is going on there. So the bloodshot is telling us that their feet were probably injured or there was a cut or something of that sort. Uh, or they, they were just walking in such rough terrain that the punctured blood vessels, blood oozed out of their, their vessels and coagulated within the tissue space between their skin and the actual vessel. So the blood didn't actually come out, but it coagulated or it hardened uh, in those, uh, between the skin and the vessel. Yeah, I'm quite sure we have a description of what bloodshot, uh, bloodshot looks like. But I want you to understand the extent to which these men were in. So they didn't stop to, to cry over the boo-boo, but they kept on walking. They appeared to be as though they were blind. They said they were drunk with fatigue. A, a nice metaphor there. So they're comparing the, the tiredness of these men to the, the fact that they were drunk. They were drunk of tiredness, deaf even to the hoots of vials. So now, um, it's interesting because this is a different com this is a different uh, version of the poem. This one says gas shells dropping softly behind. I think the poem that is in our books would say five nines dropping behind or tired five nines dropping behind. Now, tired five nines. Uh, it, me, it tells us that the bombs, the bombs then, the bombs are tired and that's a uh, parasitification there because of course they don't have the ability to, to be tired and we're telling them or we're probably hinting that the war was so continuous that it appeared as though even the bullets, even though the, even the guns, even the, the bombs were tired, they were so exhausting of all of what was going on. So recapping here we see that the beggars, the soldiers are being compared to beggars, and they're also being compared to ugly old ladies. Those are examples of simile. We see also an, a nice uh, metaphor there. Uh, then we have the re and we have the ironic title by itself, Dolce at the Core Mest. I don't know if I said it, but uh, Wilfred Owen was actually a soldier in the British Army. So what he sees here is a first-hand experience of what took place in wars. So he's writing from a first-hand experience. It's interesting because Wilfred Owen actually died, I think it was one week before the end of the First World War. And some some literature points to the fact that he died, uh, well he sent this poem here to his mother one week before he died. So it's interesting that he sent the poem to his mother and then he died and he died at the age of 25 so you imagine so they really he really had an experience firsthand of what the old lie was about the lie that it is sweet and fitting to die for one's country let's have a second look at it because the second half of the poem really goes on to show the extent to which this lie damage the lives of young men. So let's go straight into that. So remember we were just talking about the men heading back to their resting place. So while they were going back to the resting place, someone shouts out, gas, gas, quick boys. So when you hear gas, gas, it means you have to get the helmets on so that, you know, the they can prevent uh, the um, the poisonous gas from entering their nostrils and obviously entering their lungs and killing them. So it was a, a, a haste that they had to get this helmet on before they actually die. So it says what? It's, and let's go back. Let's pause a bit. I, I'm speaking fast, but I, I want to get everything in. Sorry. It says quick, quick, boys. Boys. It didn't say men. <laughs> And that's very, very important. Boys. It shows us how these soldiers were immature. Huh? An ecstasy of fumbling. If, if they were experienced men, then they would have known exactly what they had to do and how fast they had to do it. And if they were experienced, they would know that as well. They should always have on their masks. So it says what? Gas, gas, quick boys. And then somebody probably got theirs on 
just in time and then there was someone else who didn't and it said what he was yelling out and stumbling imagine that he might not have been yelling out or, or stumbling because the gas actually got him at that point but he was so anxious he was so nervous he was so afraid that he was scared of death you know he, he's, he's still a boy and he's still trying to defend this country and there he was about to die he he knew it was inevitable because i mean he's at war but at the point where he has to to admit that oh my god my stupidity or my inexperienced behavior or my inexperienced disposure is about to get me killed and realizing that mass can be put on in time it's obviously his demise so he says what floundering like a man in fire line so you can just imagine that like another compar another simile there comparison saying that the soldier appeared to be somebody who was thrown in fire or someone who was in line obviously that is quite uh, uncomfortable to actually be in fire or in line and he's telling us how much he appeared to be in pain uh, how much he appeared to be grieving how much he appeared to be shocked how much he appeared to be in a state that is not no return so it says dim through the misty pains so there i was dim there not there i was um it says there who uh, i think it, that would definitely tell us that the individual in question here is the writer owen because it goes on to say i saw him drowning so them through the misty pain so owen probably was there and in the first instant he saw him might have been blurred but he saw him there drowning you know the gas was so much the green light that's what they're talking about the gas the gas was so much that he was drowning in that gas and he was there you know just gave up and is taken by death and that was the end of that soldier so he might not have died at that instant and they had to now move on they throw him throw him in the um the wagon that he had and they had to carry on carry on walking back to the resting place the, it shows that the, the war continued even though some individual might have met his demise and that's interesting interesting line there i'm taking this part here now to mean my own thing he says what in all my dreams before my helpless sight that i am taking that literally in all my dreams that is telling me that owen had some amount of nightmares nightmares of what happened nightmares of what he had witnessed he says what in my my helpless sight he plunges at me he's remembering what happened when this person died he plunged at him and you know he has the mask on there's nothing he can do than just look at him choking guttering dying uh, that is just amazing amazing description uh, by no means is what is going on amazing but it's amazing writing don't, don't get me uh, i i get excited when i see such good writing i i don't mean it's exciting of what the, the actual idea of war is exciting i mean the writing is just good uh it's very sad very very emotive of what is actually going on if you do study the text study the um the lit the poem really well you can tear up but let's stop there and go on to the next part so we're ending things off here with Dolce at the Kuromes with the last stanza and this is the most important stanza to me because it's telling us that a change happened we are no longer talking about I or he we're actually talking about you we are putting someone in the spot and we're saying that if you were there you would know what i'm talking about if you were there to see for yourself it would be a different thing you would not tell the lie and uh, we'll talk about the lie in a little bit and it's, it starts by saying in some smothering dreams it's as though we're putting a pillow over someone's head as they're dreaming and we're we're snuffling the life out of them and they're they're panting for breath and it's it's almost painful to just 
imagine what is going on and that's why I'm saying it's a brilliant piece by Owen because it, it encapsulates the truth of what war is about. I might not have experienced it firsthand, but this is it tells us a quite a great deal. It says you too could pace behind the wagon. It's saying that if you were there and you see the way we threw this man in the wagon, you would not understand you wouldn't you would understand what the actuality of a war is. And then if you get to see the, the eyes, the white of his eyes escaping or the, the or just seeing the white of his eyes as he's being thrown there or as he's laying there, you would understand how painful how painful death is and how painful war is and he's saying what like a devil sick of sin and that is just beautiful writing because can you imagine the devil being sick of sin and they're saying like it's as though the devil who's probably the most evil person around having a line and he's saying what well, the devil is as though he's there with them and he's saying oh my god this is so cruel even me the devil i know my limits and it's shocking how much evil how, how demonic you humans are and this devil is talking like it's, it's, it's giving the idea that even the devil would be shocked at what is going on and that is just beautiful writing if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling so they're pulling the wagon that he is in and as they're pulling the wagon i'm thinking the rough terrain there and the wagon is jolting you know keeping a sound as it's going and every time it, meets, it reaches a, a rough patch or an uneven patch there is blood oozing out of the mouth and there then they're comparing the sight of it to it being um cancer uh it's saying bitter as a cut of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues now that innocent tongues can mean two things i am taking it it can actually tell us that the incurable sores may, may actually put the the soldier in the the idea or the sense of having a disease i'm thinking syphilis or gonorrhea or something of that sort and the innocent tongue that's a beautiful part there it's telling us how much this soldier might have been innocent how much this soldier might have been uh, a person who just wants to do good and there he was dying a brutal death you say is my friend that's a personal personal phrase there my friend He's talking now directly to someone. Remember this poem was written. This poem was sent by from by Owen to his mother. So I'm not thinking he's talking to his mother here, but I'm thinking he's talking probably to the person who enlisted him in the war. And he's saying, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest. You would not tell me with such high spirits. You would not tell me that a war is a good thing if you were there, if you experienced it, if you see a man dying in front of your face, you would not be so happy. It's a personal connection. I think you can almost hear it in my voice. I'm thinking that is the way Owen felt when he sent this letter to his mother and it's almost painful and he's saying what well, they're telling this lie they're telling the lie of it is sweet and fitting to die for your country and they're who are they telling it to they're telling it to children they're saying that children are desperate for glory and they are they want to be remembered they want to be uh, glorified and they would do anything for their country they want to represent their country it's fit and 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 proper to die for your country and that's a lie that's the brainwashed the the, the that's how these the children are brainwashed into thinking that it's good it's a good thing to die for your country but then he's telling us he's trying to show us that it's a lie it's not sweet and fitting when you die such a horrible death no one remembers you that, that cannot possibly be sweet and fitting that cannot possibly honorable that cannot possibly be glorious and that is just an excellent piece of writing that last line there is a beautiful irony it's an irony because it's not sweet and fitting and what after all that he has explained there surely 
this way of living, this kind of life is not sweet and fitting and the way of dying is surely not fitting either. And that is it, that was it, Dolce et the Coromess by Wilfred Owen. Hope you have enjoyed that. So we have looked at the poem Dolce et the Coromess and we have also looked at This is a Dark Time, My Love. And we can compare these two poems with the theme war. Now, war in both poems quite evident. And we, if we look at this is a dark time, I love. We see that the poem is addressed to someone. That repetition, that repetitive phrase, my love, my love. So it tells us it was written towards someone or sent towards someone. In this poem, though, Dolce et Decorumes, we see an absence of love. So it was there was yeah. It, there's evidence to show there is um, literature to support the idea that the poem was sent to his mother, but nothing in the poem shows that there's a presence of love. There's just war, just darkness, just harshness, right? So there's nothing to show directly that love is present. In the poem, This is a Dark Time, My Love, we also see a presence of nature. Red flowers bend their heads in awful sorrow. Uh, in this poem, Dolce et Decorum S, we see an absence of nature. So it probably is telling us that the war was so serious, the war was so harsh, that even nature was completely destroyed, even nature was not even present, even nature was not mentioned whatsoever. And then in Carter's poem, we see that even nature felt what was going on. It's a good comparison, it's a good... Um, comparison between Dolce at the Coromes and This is a Dark Time My Love because both poems talked about what war or what the, the impact of war is on a country right and we want to take that with us as we go towards our exam you can look at the two the poems as well on the, the theme death or survival, oppression patriotism and anything else your teachers might have taught you Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. I hope you have enjoyed this and I hope you have learned from this. Be sure to hit me up, like this, comment, suggest future poems that you wish for me to review, subscribe so you can get that update on those future poems, share this, ensure you help your colleagues also to pass the exams. Good luck and best wishes in your exams.